Any questions on the homework group before we continue with the with this uh, slide set? So again, and uh, this is now recorded. We're gonna have five groups. We have five people. Angel is gonna be for group one. Uh, Sarah group two. Mike group three. Oscar group four. And Desire is gonna be group five. Your task here is to communicate with me. You're gonna be sending me an email with the list of names in each one of these groups. And at the day of the submittal, you're gonna be responsible to upload the file. So not everybody's gonna be uploading their files. No, it's gonna be just one person. It's gonna be only one file. And are we choosing the people or are you? It is gonna be up to you guys. You work it out. If you All need right. help, let me know right now. When we started Angel, at the beginning you said Angel, and then you put your name, and then you put Group One. You guys need some time to decide on your uh, on your team. Uh, yeah, at some point. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. At the end of this lecture, I'm going to leave the discussion open. I'm going to leave the meeting on, and you guys can chat if this makes sense. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so Erica is going to be in group one. Am I correct, Erica? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, you are going to be the communicator in this group. Uh, professor, did you want us to just send um, an email like who's in, like who's yeah. in our group? Okay. Yes, you're going to be sending an email. You're saying okay. this is going to be group number. You put the group number in the top of the subject, and put the list of name names in the um, in the manuscript in the in the text of the email itself. All right. All right. Good luck. Now to continue for the sheer wall uh, discussion that we started, we said um, the best way is to put in the longitudinal direction, transverse direction. And you understand that we can hit in any direction. And um, let's say that you have 100 kips here. If you have, and if you put it on an angle, you're going to end up by resolving this 100 kips into two components. And each one of these two components gave you less than 100 kips. Right? But this 100 kips is going to be the same force that you put in any direction. So let's say in this direction, you put 100 kips, and here 100, and here 100. And when you apply it, you allow, you apply it only at one time, which means you don't apply the force in the X and then the Y at the same time. No, you apply it once in the X direction, done with the analysis, you apply it in the Y direction. If you think about it this way, you say, it means putting this force here on an angle is gonna be meaningless because I can just maximize the force if I put it in the X once and the Y once. Unless I have a wall that's gonna be inclined in this direction. So if you have here a wall in a certain angle, so in this case, you can put the force in the same direction as the wall. We discuss the minimum vertical and horizontal steel ratio. So it's gonna be both directions, gonna be 0 0.0025. And this is gonna be applied to shear walls. What are shear walls? It's gonna be this wall's design to support significant amount of shear force. So in the group homework, I'm gonna say this is gonna be a shear wall. I'm gonna be asking you to do the amount of reinforcement. And also I'm gonna be asking you to do the shear design, which we're gonna be going through right now. Here's a standard wall revision. It shows here that you have this is what you call here the wall reinforcing, number six at 16, each way, each face. And then at the end, we have this jam bars. It's going to be eight, number eight, as shown in this picture. And this uh, concrete wall here is 12 inch thick. 
and this eight number eight is gonna be at each end. We have a figure for it. So it's gonna be here, this figure seven four. We have eight three bars, this gonna be the eight number eight. And then you have a special ties around it. And here is the wall reinforcing. This for the rest of the wall. To summarize here, the shear wall reinforcing requirements, minimum reinforcement in both vertical direction, horizontal direction, is gonna be 0 0.0025. Maximum spacing between two rebars gonna be 18 inch, which means 16 is okay, 20 is not good. It says here, maximum spacing. You need to use here two state layers. Once the shear demand is gonna be more than this value here. This ACV means the cross section area of the wall resisting shear. So if the wall length, let's say 10 feet and the width is gonna be a foot. Let me draw it here for quick. Here's the wall. The length width is 10 feet and the width is a foot. This cross section area, resisting shear, just like in plan view. And here's the shear force acting on it this way, let's say. This ACV is equal to one foot. So we see here 12 inches times 120 inches equals. Can someone help with this? Yes. Give me this number, right? Yes. All right. So this gonna be ACV, and it needs to be in inches. So it's gonna be the total cross section area of the wall in plan view. So if I give you here the wall length, give you the wall thickness, you can figure out the ACV. Okay. Good. Also, it says here you need to have nine degrees center hook or hundred degree. When this is gonna happen? You will do this anyways. So in standard practice. You're gonna provide this 90 degree or 180 degree hooks for the wall reinforcement in the jam area. You're gonna say, what do you mean by that? I'm gonna say, okay, let's go back here. You see what happened? This is actually the wall reinforcement. You see this line here is the wall reinforcement. If I may do it this way. And of course, it's gonna be spliced, right? This is gonna be the wall reinforcement. Here's the other side of the wall reinforcement. This here, nine degree center hook. You need to hook this rebar in the jam section to provide good anchorage, all right? Here's the shear equation. If you remember the shear equation, whenever we have, uh, in the case when we have this uh, beam design, we say phi VN is gonna be equal to phi factor. And how much was the phi factor for beams? Anyone remembers for beams? Phi factor, shear and beams, how much was the fee factor? 490. Is it 0 0.9, 0 0.65, 0 0.75? Can you look it up, please? 0 0.75, thanks, Nick. So the fee is usually gonna be 0 0.75, except for shear walls. For shear walls, it's gonna be 0 0.6, so let me write it here. Fee factor for shear walls is how much here? 0 0.6. So only for shear walls, see this for shear walls, you can say only again for shear walls. So please don't use 0.75 for shear walls. Be sure that you use 0.6. The equations can be very similar to what you have seen in beam design, but it's gonna be a little bit different. It says here, VN is gonna be equal to the cross section area which is the same that we have done for beams. For beam, we call it BD. For shear walls, it's gonna be wall time thickness, but we don't use D, we just use the entire wall length. So ACV, you guys know how to do the ACV, right? We have just done it. And then it says here, in the past, in beams, we used to use here too. This alpha C, which is a shear factor, if you remember in punching, it used to be four. For beams, it was two, but here is gonna be a variable. And this variable is gonna be based on this condition. This says gonna be based on the wall length and the wall height. Total wall length, total wall height. Meaning the wall height is gonna be total height of the wall. It's not just for one story, it's gonna be for the entire building. 
if this wall is continuous, let's say three levels, take the total height of the wall. And then it says here, when you have a short wall, your factor, this is gonna be, right? When H over LW, look at this. When you have short walls, when the height divided by the length, what height? Here's the height divided by the length. is gonna be smaller than one and a half, which means it's gonna be squat wall. It's gonna be kind of short wall. The shear factor is gonna be three. When you have a tall wall, like when the height divided by the length is more than 2.0 or equal to 2.0, in this case, it's gonna be equal to two. It's gonna be like beams. So the resistance of the wall itself in shear can be very similar, identical to what you have in beams if this wall is kind of long wall, like tall wall, excuse me, when the height is big. When the height is small, the shear resistance is gonna increase. By how much factor? I'm gonna say by the factor of two to three. How about if it's gonna be in the middle? Because it says here less than or equal one and a half, more than or equal 2.0, it says just do interpolation. So I guess now I'm familiar with this. This is gonna be for the concrete strength of the shear wall and shear, right? Including, of course, ACV. So what is that? It says here, the vertical shear ratio, this row N is gonna be the, the excuse me, the horizontal shear ratio, which is in many cases gonna be the same as the vertical shear ratio. We just take them equal to each other. And it says here's gonna be horizontal shear ratio, but lie by the strength of the steam. So if you think about this, if you take this number here for this ratio, apply by ACV, it's gonna get you AS. It's gonna get you the total horizontal reinforcement that you provide in the wall. Because you take this row N multiplied by ACV. Row N is what? Inch square per square foot or per square inch. Inch square per square inch, right? It's gonna be steel area divided by concrete area. This here is gonna be concrete area. So concrete area is gonna get canceled and then you end up with square inches over steel. FY is gonna be yield the trends. The exam is gonna make it easy for us. Here is the alpha C interpolation. So when you have a short wall, this is gonna be the wall height divided by the wall length is less than one and a half. You are gonna be at three. Once you go up of two, it's gonna be equal to 2.0. In the middle, you can use this factory. You can use this equation for the interpolation. All right, maximum shear trends very similar to beams. It's gonna be eight square root of ACV, uh, square root of A prime C times ACV. So the maximum factor that you use here for the steel and concrete combined is gonna be equal to eight. One example, it says minimum reinforcement of a 16 inch thick shear wall in the horizontal direction is nearly. It just says a minimum reinforcement. I don't have here any design forces, meaning that all what I need to do here is just find it out based on the 0 0.0025, the steer ratio here, which is this one here. It says, what is the minimum, but doesn't give you your design force. If I have design force, I need to include it and provide the steel needed. I have some option. It says here, number five at 14, each face, which means that now I'm gonna have two layers and this makes sense. Once the wall becomes here 10 inch, you need to provide two layers. So this here, 16 inch, I need two layers. Number five at 14, five at 16, six at six inches. Any of the spacing here is good because it's gonna be less than 18 inch, but I need to see which one is gonna make it work, right? And of course, I need to pick the most economical uh, solution, which means uh, the answer that's gonna give me here the least amount of reinforcement. Uh, here's the minimum reinforcement ratio, uh, 0.0025, multiplied by the cross-section area. So I'm gonna be taking here 12 inch for the length, multiplied by 16 inch. So I know that the wall is longer, but I don't know the exact length of the wall. So I'm gonna be doing it per foot. So I'm gonna be taking here a foot. So this width here is gonna be a foot, from here to there, can shrink this a little bit. It's gonna be 12 inch, and the thickness of it is 16 inch. So for this little area, the steel needed per foot is gonna be 0.48 square inch. Now I'm gonna have here two faces, two layers of steel. So each layer is gonna be taking 50% of this. So for each layer is gonna be 0.24. Now someone's gonna say not very clear. I'm gonna go back here to one of the pictures. I have two layers of steel for the horizontal rebars. 
total is going to be 0.48 square inch per foot. Each side is going to be 0.24 and 0.24. All right. I'll try here number five because look at the options. Number five, number five. Let's see which one's going to make it work. Number six at 60 at six inches give me a lot of rebars because the spacing here is going to be very small and the bar size is big. So I'm going to try number five at 14 and number five at 16. And I'm just hoping that number five at 16 is going to make it work because it's going to be the least amount of reinforcement that you put if you go with this program. So I'm going to try here number five. You're going to say, I need 0.24 square inch. One rebar is going to get me here 0.31. And the question is, what the spacing should I go with? So I'm going to be taking this is going to be here A, B. And 0.24 is the needed. So I'm going to say, this is what you're looking for. Times 12. To have it per foot. So this 12 because I have 12 inches in a foot. Right? So the spacing needed here is 15.5. This is going to be the maximum spacing. If you want this to work, you need to go with maximum spacing of 15.5. Now I have two options. I have 14 and 16. I'm going to say if I go with 16, I'm going to have here less reinforcing than needed. So I have to go with here with number 14, number five at 14 inch. So I'm going to go with the option E. Okay. Use number five at 14. Don't forget to say each phase. If you didn't say here each phase, it means that you provide number five at 14 in the middle only. So you got to be very careful about this. Second example, they give me here 14 inch thick concrete shear wall for 1,000 PSI. And the seismic shear, it says equal to 380 kips. This is going to be V sub U. It says here, expose the seismic shear is going to be V sub U. This is going to be ultimate, which means it's going to be factored. It's going to be 380 kips. This is the demand on the wall. The shear wall height is 16 feet. Do I need the wall height or the wall length? It says while the width, which means the length is going to be 10 feet. Width in this example is the same as length. So the wall length here in plan view, when you look at it, is going to be 10 feet. The thickness is going to be 14 inch. Here we go. You're going to see this dimension here is going to be 120 inches. And this dimension here is going to be how much? It's going to be 14 inches. It's going to be the cross-section area. But the wall height is going to be 16 feet. Now, take 16 divided by 10 is going to be 1.6. Why do I care about this? I'm going to take you back here because I care about this factor. It's going to be 1.6. 1.6 meaning about here. So it's not going to be really 3. It's not 3D2. Really it's going to be somewhere in the middle. And we're going to see how to solve for this. Now, it says here, minimum reinforcement needed. Now, minimum reinforcement is going to be controlled by two factors. Factor number one is going to be the minimum steel ratio. What minimum steel ratio? I'm going to say, like in this example, the 0 0.0025. Number two, by the design force. So in this case, I need to solve for the design force, right? And see how much reinforcing I need. And then also, I need to put the minimum. And they give me some options with each phase. I'm going to say, let me solve first for this alpha sub C. I'm going to be taking this here from this uh, uh, linear interpolation. Uh, I'm going to take you back. Here's the linear interpolation, alpha sub C equal to six minus two times this aspect ratio of the wall. You say, okay, here's six minus two aspect ratio. This aspect ratio is going to be equal to 16 divided by 10. Here we go. And with that, the factor alpha sub C is going to be equal to 2.8. So it's not going to be three. It is not two. It is also a good number here. And here is my shear equation. Just going to repeat it. The fee factor, as you see here, is going to be equal to 0.6. So, okay, ACV, I have the total length of the wall. It's going to be 14 inch times the total length of the wall is 10 feet times 12. So this here is the wall length. And it's going to be the wall thickness. Here's the wall length, 120 times 14. 120 times 14. And then apply by 
the alpha sub c, the shear factor 2.8, square root of 4,000 divided by 1,000, plus rho n multiplied by 60. So I get to be careful. I put this here, everything to be in KSI because I divide this here by 1,000, right? If you did not divide this by 1,000, I should have used here 60,000 PSI. So you got to be careful about this. Now, in this equation here, I set PVN to be equal to V sub U because this is actually is giving V sub U, not PVN. And with that, I have my variable rho N, the steer ratio that I need to find out. So the steer ratio, if you solve this equation, is going to be equal to the following. It's going to be equal to 0 0.0033. Minimum according to the code is going to be 0 0.0025, whether you know the amount of shear force or not. Now, which one controls? I need this number here for the strength of the wall. But for the minimum according to the code, this gave you like the minimum factor is going to be 0 0.0025. So I guess this gave you the answer that controls. This gave you the steer ratio I need to use on my design. So, okay, now let me find out the amount of steel needed. Here's the amount of steel. Now, this gives me the steel ratio that I need to use based on this analysis 0 0.0033 times 14 inch, the wall thickness times 12 inch, which is one foot. So here's, it's gonna be like this. This is here's gonna be 14 inch for the wall thickness, just considered only 12 inch, like a section of the wall, not the whole thing. And with that, I have. 0.554 square inch per foot. This is gonna be per foot. Now I understand that I'm gonna have rebars here because I have two faces, one at each side. I'm gonna divide this by two. So each one of the sides, I will need at least 0.277. How can I do it? Now I have a few options. So I'm gonna say, let me try again the same thing that I've done in example one. I can take the 0 0.31, which is A sub B. So I'm going to say this is here A, B, right? So let me write it down. This is going to be A, B. 0 0.31 divided by the needed 0 0.277 multiplied by 12 inch, which means per foot. Now I need the spacing to be maximum of 13.4. So I'm going to say this is going to be the maximum spacing that you can use. Maximum spacing between bars. Now let me go back here to the options. I have number five at 12, number six, I don't really need this, right? It's gonna be too much. Number five at 16, so it seemed that this gave you my answer. Number five at 12 is gonna be good because my max is gonna be 13.4. Any questions? I'm done. And you are done with all the material of uh, of this course for this semester. So, right on. Thank you. Thank you. It's a lot of info. Yeah, sure. Yes, good luck with your uh, process of metal grades and final. We can have lots of discussion. We're gonna have, yeah, we're gonna have lots of discussion over these two coming lectures. Here is the final submittal, it's gonna be May 6th. In two days from now, so I'm going to make it, um, when do you guys want to submit it? Submit what the homework? Yeah, this one. The group, we can do it over the weekend. Should I do end of Sunday? The ninth is good? I think end of Sunday should be good. Yeah, end of Sunday. Okay, good. It should be very simple because the good thing about it, I mean, you have seen here the example, right? It should be very simple. The good thing also is giving the exam, right? So don't just let someone solve it and you guys don't care about it. No, it's gonna be very important that 
all of you guys, you read it and you be sure that you know how to do it. And you do it a couple of times. Any questions for any subject that we have covered here? Professor, I had a question about the submittal, uh, not the submittal, the discussion. Yes. If we are, if we do our discussion on the 6th, does that mean we don't have to show up for the 11th? You don't have to. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. No problem. No problem. I had a question, Professor. So, um, for on these on these walls, do you have to design each section and each uh, floor accordingly to the design mode at that point, or does it kind of act more or less like a column? Um, when it comes to the sharing, let's say that your wall is four story, right? Um, so the question is, do you think that the minimum is going to be controlling your design? Let's say that you have another shear wall that you're designing, like this one here. Right. You decide that number five at 14 is going to be good just to satisfy the minimum, right? So the question is, when it comes to the shear force, and let's say that you have here a few stores, let's say four stores. Here's the foundation. So you said, my minimum reinforcement is gonna be number five at 14. Good, each phase. Now you're gonna be looking at the shear force. So the shear force here is gonna be different from here, different from here, different from here, right? When you go down, the shear force demand is gonna increase. So you start here to run your numbers based on the shear force. And then you find that, that here at this level, I need, let me do it in a white background. I need here number five, at 12 inch and of course each phase right and then you try here for this level based on the shear demand here and then you find out that you still need number five at 12 inch each phase and then here you start to look at this and then you say minimum is okay minimum enforcement which means this number is good number five at 14. Now, do I need to try the roof? I'm gonna say no, because the roof is gonna be smaller shear force. So I know that minimum is gonna be also okay in here by just inspection. So in a case like this, for the top two levels, I'm gonna be providing here number five at 14. Once I go down here, I'm gonna put number five at 12. And this is gonna be the case in most walls that you see, you're not gonna see the same reinforcement to be all the same unless minimum controls the entire wall. Because in some cases, the shear wall doesn't have lots of shear force. And you can just use a minimum, and it's going to be enough for you. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. So I have a question here about, uh, about is it OK if we submit it Tuesday night? I want it to be maybe Monday night, so maybe I can also open it and discuss with you guys. Um, yeah, that could work. Um, so just should I make it Monday or should I make it Sunday night? Um, Monday is good. Okay, all right, we'll do it Monday. Thank you. Okay, right, Monday. Final will be cumulative, yes. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll see you uh, this coming Thursday. Yeah, I had trouble on, I think on the first exam, it was that we had a double reinforced uh, member. It was the final question of the first exam. Okay. And I was having trouble following with the with the slides. So uh, do you want me to open certain slides, Seth? 
Uh, let me see which one it was. I believe I have them right here. Number seven. Number seven. Yep. Starting at slide six. Okay. And then this was a while ago, but I remember having trouble with this, so. Okay. So. Yeah, could you, could you cover that idea of, I remember you saying that the steel, we assume the steel to be yielding at the. Yeah, the compression. The compression. Correct. Okay, here's the issue. I guess in one of this uh, problems, um, usually you assume the steel here is yielding, right? That yeah. This is steel, not, not this one, excuse me. No. You assume the top steel is yielding. And if this assumption is correct, you can say that AS2 is going to be equal to AS prime, which means that you take the bottom steel here and then split it into two areas, AS1 and AS2. You say, for example, AS1 is going to be the tension steel and AS2 is going to be equals to the compression steel. As if, uh, there's a good, uh, yeah, this, this is a good one. This okay. is the right one. This is the right slide that you need to look at. Slide three. Yeah. So if we assume that the steel is yielding, right, at the bottom, it means this AS1 plus AS2, which is AS, right, the total steel at the bottom is going to be yielding. So if you assume also the top steel is yielding, this AS prime, so you can take a portion of this steel at the bottom, a portion of this AS, we're going to call it here AS2, and you say it's going to be equal to AS prime. So in this case, AS1 is going to be equal to the difference between AS and AS prime, like in here. It doesn't mean that you have here two separate tension forces. It is going to be, mm -hmm. at the end, it's going to be one tension force, but we'd like to split it so that we have here a coven. We can take it aside and work with it just to make it easier in our answer. And this AS1 is going to be balanced with the compression and the conflict. Because usually mm -hmm. we'd like to see this coupled thing. So in this case, we say it's going to be one of these forces times the distance, one of these forces times the distance. This is a basic idea of splitting into two forces. Okay. Yeah. So the problem, if the steel on the top is not yielding, what's going to happen? This assumption is wrong. Right? Yeah. If the top of steel is not yielding, so you cannot really say that this steel is going to be bent with a section of that steel. And in a case like this, you're going to be following this example here. You need to find out the actual strain in the steel, in the compression. Because you know here, the steel here is going to be yielding. And here, the concrete is going to be at 0.03. So once you yeah. find out the strain in the compression steel, now you find the actual stress in the steel, in the compression. And then you continue, you follow this example by finding out the force here, they're going to have compression on the concrete. So here, the tension, you say, well, I know the tension force. This tension force is used to be equal to AS times FY. Oh, now yeah, we have yeah. the compression in the concrete. This is going to be about here. And then you have another compression in the steel. You're going to say, how can I get this compression in the steel? You're going to say it's going to be equal to the stress in the steel based on this actual strain in the steel multiplied by AS prime. So can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, absolutely. So the compression of the concrete is how much? If I may take it back here. Compression of the concrete is what? 0.85 prime C A B, right? Yeah. Okay. And the total tension of the steel is gonna be AS, just total tension of the steel. In this case, it's gonna be three number eleven multiplied by sixty K side. So we're gonna say okay. Total tension here is the steel is going to be AS times FY. So now what I'm trying to do here is to assume that the bottom steel only is yielding, the top steel is not yielding. Okay. okay. So the compression of the concrete is 0.85 F prime C times A, the compression block there. How about the steel here? The steel is going to have some compression. It's going to be equal to 
f prime s multiplied by a s prime. A s prime, you have it. How about f s prime? Well, you have absolute s prime. Where did you get this from? You're going to do here comparison for the strain because you have the strain here and then you have the strain there at the bottom. So you can figure out the strain in the compression steel. If you take this strain multiplied by 29,000 psi, you will get to the stress in the compression steel. Okay. So, um, thank you. Yeah, I'll look over that. Okay, all right. And you have a very good example here. It's solved first yeah. that you assume that the compression seal is yielding, and then you find out that it doesn't yield. And then after you find out that it doesn't yield, uh, the estimate or the assumption was wrong. Now you need to divide here. You need to develop this equation from scratch, right? Or you can just use this equation. So look at the slide number nine. And let me know by next time if you still have the same question. Okay, I'll go over. You said uh, number four is where we assume that it yields, and number five is where we see that it doesn't? Or so first, four is... first, we assume that all the steel yields. It's written okay. right there, right? So yeah. with this assumption, here we go. And here's two, based on the same assumption, right? And then we try to find out the strain in the compression steel. We find out the compression of the steel and turn to be what? Look at this. The compression of the steel was equal to, in the compression steel, 0.0015. But the yield point is at 0 0.00207. So this is not yielding. Mm, okay. So when this happens, at the end of this item four, we find out that the bottom seal is yielding, top seal is not yielding. So what should we do? Now we need to change the rule. So start from this line here, number eight. We figured out at that point that the compression seal is not yielding. It's going to be only the tensile steel. And then we start to solve it differently. OK. Now, this gave you like the tough method or the longer method of doing it. This gave you the shorter method. If you are able to prove that this is still here, is yielding, you're good. So you can finish it quick. Yeah. But if it doesn't work this way, you have to do the start from item number five. Got it. Thank you. No problem. A uh, question here from Ramsey. She says, um, for internal mold, do we need reinforcement on each side? For an each face, you say it depends on the wall thickness. If the wall thickness is eight inches, you don't need to. Once you go beyond 10 inches, you'll need to. Uh, 